Okay guys, unit 9 time. Parametric, polar, and vector valued functions. After this, just one more unit. Unit 10, series. This is the first unit with no AB. Okay, let's move on. What is a parametric equation? A parametric function is a function that has an x-coordinate defined as a function of t, let's say 3t squared plus t, and it has a y-coordinate, y equals sine of t, let's say, okay? Therefore, the entire parametric equation can be rewritten like something f of t equals the x-coordinate 3t squared plus t comma the y-coordinate sine of t such that when you plug in a value of t into the parametric equation you get out an x and a y-coordinate. It is effectively an equa a function that takes in one input and gives two outputs. Okay? The way parametric equations are shown on the BC exam is just in this fashion. You have a function defined in terms of t, and for any time t, you're given an x and y coordinate. This is often used to model uh, two-dimensional planar motion. Like, let's say I have a car, and the car is driving according to this function. At any time t, I know exactly where the car is in two-dimensional space. Now, if I wanted to take the derivative of this, we have a x function and we have a y function. So we're going to need to differentiate both of those individually. Cool sign. This right here, we're going to differentiate x with respect to t. We're going to take dx dt. And this right here, we're going to differentiate y with respect to t, dy dt. So, the way we do that is we just take the derivative as normal, and we say dx dt equals 6t plus 1. And we take the derivative as normal here, dy dt equals cosine t. Okay, but now we have two derivatives. How are we going to simplify that into 1 f prime of t, which is the same as dy dx? How do you get dy dx from a dx dt and a dy dt? Well, if I were to do dy dt divided by dx dt, we do keep change flip. It's dy dt times dt dx, and you can see these cancel, and we're left with dy dx. So the way you get from here to here is you just take dx, or sorry, dy dt over dx dt. This equals 6t plus 1 over cosine t. That's how you take the derivative of a parametric equation. To take the second derivative of a parametric equation, it's a little more complicated, it's a little less intuitive. Okay, let's stick with our equation right here. f of t equals 3t squared plus t comma sine t, such that x equals 3t squared plus t, and y equals sine of t. In order to find f double prime of t, or d squared y dx squared, that would involve taking first finding dy dx, which we found right here. Once we have dy dx, we can plug it into this formula. You take the derivative of dy dx, and you divide that by the derivative of x with respect to time. Okay, so let me show you what that looks like. This is the formula we do for second derivatives of parametric equations. Let's take our dy dx, which is right here, 6t plus 1 over cosine t. Product rule, quotient rule, whatever you want to use. 
Okay, so after we do a uh, quotient rule, that's what we get for the derivative dy dx. And then we divide the whole thing by dx dt, and we multiply the denominator by dx dt. And where's dx dt? Where did I put that? It's up here. 6t plus 1. So we put this in parentheses, multiply by 6t plus 1. That is your second derivative of parametric function. It's not that big of a learning curve. It's just reintroduction of all the derivative rules that we've been working on uh, in the very beginning of the BC course. It's just memorize a new formula, get familiar with a new type of function, and just do some practice differentiating it. Again, go to Khan Academy. You can message me on Discord for help. I don't charge. Be my guest. Okay, moving on. We are going to need to learn how to do arc length with parametric functions. There was a very specific reason why I uh, gave you the conceptual understanding for arc length back in Unit 6, our Applications of the Integral video, because that conceptual understanding of the formula will come back again right here for de devising a formula or deriving a formula for arc length of parametric functions. Okay. I said in the previous video that arc length can be approximated using infinitely small triangles, such that the hypotenuse is the function itself, the, uh, the horizontal leg would be your dx, your infinitely small change in x, and the vertical leg would be your infinitely small change in y. Okay? So, with normal functions, we would differentiate x with respect to x, which would end up being 1, and we would differentiate y with respect to x, which would give us dy dx. And having done that, we could find the uh, infinite change in our hypotenuse, and we would use Pythagorean theorem for that. Our change in x, which was 1 we derived, squared, plus our change in y, dy dx, squared, all in the radical. And that was our formula for uh, arc length in normal functions, and we would put that in the integral and integrate it. However, here, with parametric functions, differentiating with respect to x does not yield 1, because x is its own function. Okay? Here, in a parametric function, we would draw our triangle and the horizontal leg would be dx dt, and the vertical leg would be dy dt. Because we have a rate of change of our x that is independent of the rate of change of our y. So then our formula becomes, you know, we still use Pythagorean theorem, it's no different. dx dt squared plus dy dt all squared. And then we would put that in the radical, and we would integrate that from our bounds. So that's the formula for arc length in a parametric function. We have uh, another form of interpreting parametric equations, and that's called vector-valued functions. These are a type of parametric equation, and they're uh, exhibited in largely the same way. Let's say we're given an x of t equals some function for x, uh, let's see, 2t squared plus 1, some function for y, 2 rad x. But to differentiate this, you would be, you wouldn't be asked to differentiate it in the form of dy dx you would be asked to find a function v of t. So there are two types you can differentiate these types of functions. You can find a value for dy dx, which is a magnitude of the rate of change. But here, if we differentiate to get a function v of t, we're keeping the two components separate. Now let me show you what I mean by that by providing an example. To differentiate vector valued functions, you just take the derivative of this guy, which would be 4t, 
and you take the derivative of this guy, which would be just 1 over rad x. So v of t now has the derivative of the x position, this is dx dt, as the x, uh, as the left product, and it has dy dt as the right product. So with this, this is useful because it gives you the velocity in the x direction at any point in time and the velocity in the y direction at any point in time. So this means something to us. That means uh, if we combine the velocity in the x direction and the velocity in the y direction, you know, if you're given, uh, you have a velocity in the x direction and you have a velocity in the y direction, you can do Pythagorean theorem to calculate the total magnitude of the velocity. So this would be dx dt, this would be dy dt, or in terms of your v of t, this would just be y, and this would just be x. And here would be your magnitude. So you would just take 4t squared plus 1 over rad x all squared, put that in the radical, and that would be a function for the magnitude of the velocity the total velocity vector. I don't know if uh, many of you have taken physics class before, but in physics, we learn about this thing called a vector. A vector is just a value that has direction, okay? In early elementary school, when you were studying physics, you know, you studied um, speed, things like temperature, mass, and you studied things that only had magnitude. Now, the word magnitude in this context means that you have a number, you have a measurement, you have a measurement of miles per hour, maybe, but that's just it. It's a measurement of miles per hour. You did not say which direction. You did not specify a direction. Okay? So a value that does not have any directional component, that does not provide any information regarding direction, is a magnitude. A vector is a value that provides magnitude and direction. Okay. So, this x component here would be the horizontal velocity vector. It would be called a vector component because it is a component of the actual vector here. And you would have the y component of the velocity vector. And the Horizontal component and the vertical component can be combined using Pythagorean theorem to produce the actual vector. Now, in a vector-valued function, the vector could be anything. It could stem like this, which we saw in this triangle. Y component could be negative. It could stem like this. Both components could be negative. A vector, this is just what I'm trying to get across to you guys, specifies a direction, okay? The Orientation of the line specifies the direction, the length of the line specifies the magnitude, or the amount of miles per hour, or speed, whatever, acceleration. And what you're also able to do is you can say it's the part, let's say this is the velocity of a particle, you could say the velocity of the particle in the x direction is given by this, and the velocity of the particle in the y direction is given by this. Uh, just one more thing before we move on to some practice problems. Uh, notice here with vector valued functions, the function stayed like on its side of the comma, okay? It stayed separate as this function defines x and this function defines y. Therefore, taking the second derivative is just as easy. If I wanted to find a function for a of t, okay, I would just differentiate the x-coordinate again, which would become 4, and I would differentiate the y-coordinate again, which would become, uh, what is it, negative 1 over 2 rad x. So that would be your a of t function. There's no other formula here, because this formula only applies for when we want to combine these two equations into a single dy dx. This formula only applies when we want to 
obtain a derivative of y with respect to x. Here, we're keeping both separate. We're keeping this as a dx dt, and we're keeping this as a dy dt. So technically, we have two derivatives here. This formula was useful for combining them into one derivative. Okay, let's move on to some practice problems. Again, I'm taking these from Khan Academy. They're the greatest practice problems you could ever find. A particle moves in the xy plane so that at any time t, its coordinates can be defined by uh, the x component equals t to the third minus 2t, and the y coordinate is defined by 3t plus 1. What is the particle's velocity vector at t equals 3? Okay. So it asks for the velocity vector. So what that means is we're going to provide our answer like this, as a set of, as a coordinate, that look, in the form of a coordinate. If it asked for the magnitude of the velocity, if it asked for this, we would provide it as a single number processed through this formula right here, okay? Because the velocity vector is the x component and the y component individually. The, velo the magnitude of the velocity is the hypotenuse, the combined uh, velocity vector. And you find the hypotenuse with this formula, rad um, x component of the velocity squared plus y component of the velocity squared. But anyway, we're just looking at vector now. So what's the particle velocity vector at t equals 3? So first, this becomes, uh, you know, position of the particle equals t to the third minus 2t comma 3t plus 1. And then we differentiate that to get the function for the velocity vector, 3t squared minus 2 comma 3. So we plug in t equals 3 v of 3 becomes 3 times 9 minus 2 comma 3 becomes 25 comma 3 and that's your final answer for the velocity vector they give you a little noise when you get it right anywho another type of question you might be able to get with this is sort of um Sort of a refresher on related rates, bringing this into related rates. Only briefly, it's not that difficult. A particle moves along the curve x, y to the third equals 40. A particle moves along the curve x, y to the third equals 40, so that the x-coordinate is increasing at a constant rate of 5 units per minute. So what it just told us is dx dt equals 5 units per minute. What is the rate of change of the particle's y-coordinate? So we're looking for dy dt. That's what we're looking for. When the particle is at the point 5 comma 2. Okay? So this is just like a spin on related rates. We differentiate the function up here. Uh, it's product rule, that's first times derivative of the second. And again, we're differentiating with respect to time here, so we need to include our dy dt when we differentiate y, plus y to the third dx dt, we include our dx dt when we differentiate x. And now we just plug in our values and solve. Uh, x is 5 times 3y squared uh, 4 times dy dt, which is what we're looking for, plus y to the third, which is 8, times dx dt, which is 5. 3 times 4, 12, times 5, 60, times dy dt, plus...
Oh, my mistake. I forgot to differentiate the other side of the equal sign. The derivative of 40 is 0. Plus 40 equals 0. 8 times 5 becomes 40. Yeah, sorry. Remember to differentiate both sides of your equal sign and related rates. But anyway, you can solve this now. 60 dy dt equals negative 40. And dy dt equals negative 2 over 3. And it asked for dy dt, that's your answer. And remember to provide units. Units per minute, because that's what we were given. Third type of problem. This is, uh, in my opinion, the most confusing type of problem. It's not difficult per se, but it, it's not intuitive. So we're going to go over this type of problem too. A particle moving in the xy plane has a velocity vector given by v of t equals 3t to the third, comma, 12t squared. What is the magnitude of the displacement of displacement of the particle between time t equals 3 and time t equals 8? Okay, this we're told is a calculator active problem, so let me get that. So to calculate displacement, you're going to need to use this method, okay? Uh, first, you're going to need to calculate the x component of the displacement. You're going to need to calculate the change in x, and you're going to need to calculate the y component of the displacement, change in y, separately. Okay? So let's start with change in x. Change in x is just... Um, I think you guys remember from our Unit 6 video on uh, applications of the integral that uh, you can calculate total distance by integrating velocity, by taking the definite integral of velocity. So we were given velocity, and to get total distance, we're going to take a definite integral of velocity. So the total change in x, the total uh, distance, the total horizontal distance traveled, is the integral from 3 to 8 of the x component of the velocity, which is 3t to the third dt. And the change in y is uh, same principle, the definite integral from 3 to 8 of the y component of our velocity, which is 12t squared dt. So once you evaluate these values, let me bring out my calculator to do that for you. A bit of a tip on how to use the calculator. I think most of you know that if you plug something into y equals some function, uh, you're able to hit second trace to get calc. And 6 and 7 are uh, the derivative at a point and the definite integral. So if you want to calculate the rate of change at a point or the definite integral on a calculator, you can do that. But I prefer not to do that. I prefer to go to the home screen where you've got all the calculations, etc. And I prefer to do math and then press 9, which just gives me the definite integral on the math. On the math home screen. That's You press the math button and then you press 9. Okay, so after you plug both of these into your calculator, you get these numbers. And then from there... Uh, since we have an x component and a y component, and we're asked for the magnitude, we need to use this formula to unite these into one unified vector, Pythagorean theorem formula. That's just rad change in x squared plus change in y squared, and that gives you the magnitude of the vector. I pull that into my calculator, that's 3582. Uh, in Calc BC, we always round to three decimal places, 0, 7, 0. Always round to three decimal places, no exceptions, ever. Unless told otherwise, obviously. And so that's your answer for the velocity vector. The magnitude of the velocity, excuse me. Magnitude of the displacement. I'm, I'm very good with this, as you can tell. Polar coordinates or polar functions. 
All right. So, up until now, you've been defining functions in terms of uh, x coordinates, a horizontal location, and a y coordinate, a vertical location. But functions can be defined a second way. Okay? If I were to draw a coordinate plane here, you could identify a point based off of its uh, horizontal distance from the origin, its x coordinate, and uh, its vertical distance from the origin, its y coordinate. Or you could define a point by its uh, distance, its the, the hard distance from the origin, and the angle between that line and the x-axis. Okay? You can define a point that way. This point would be uh, pi over 4, and let's say with a distance of 8. Sounds about right. So that's a polar function. A polar function doesn't deal with x and y, it deals with some angle theta and some distance r, meant to represent radius. Okay. So, one example of a polar equation, polar function, radius, r of theta, equals 3 sine theta. Okay? Now, what that would look like is it would look like this, if you plotted it. It's supposed to be a perfect circle, but we all know how good I am at drawing. So at this angle, if you go back to your unit circle, at this angle, theta is 0. So that means sine of 0 is 0. And if sine of 0 is 0, that means our radius is 0. So the radius touches the origin. We have 0 radius. And then up here, at pi over 4, sine is rad 2 over 2. So we have a pretty good radius. And then up at pi over 2, that's when sine of theta is at its maximum. At pi over 2, sine of theta is 1. So if sine of theta is 1 times 3, it's 3. So the radius is 3 right here. The radius is at its maximum at this angle. And the cycle repeats down as we come closer to the origin. Now, there is one way that we can convert between the xy coordinate system and the polar coordinate system. If we were to draw a triangle such as this, such that this point represents our point of interest, x comma y, or r comma theta. This, the hypotenuse, would represent our r, our distance, to the point. This angle right here would represent our theta. This distance represent our x, and this distance would represent our y. Okay. So, we can convert between these values. If we have r, and we want y, we know y is adjacent, or no, sorry, opposite, over hypotenuse. So if we take sine theta, sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse, and we multiply that by the hypotenuse, we get the opposite, okay? Let me say that again, slower. Sine theta is the same as opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite equals y, hypotenuse equals r. So if we take y over r and multiply it by r, then we get y. That's ex effectively what this is telling us. The same principle holds true for cosine. The radius times cosine theta equals x. Cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent is the x-coordinate. The hypotenuse is the radius, the distance. So if we take r times the adjacent over r, we get the adjacent, which is the same as x. Okay? So that's how you convert between x and y and uh, theta and r.
commit these equations to memory, okay? This, these are very important for your uh, AP exam. Khan Academy practice problem. Let r be the polar function r of theta, r of theta equals 7e to the negative theta, okay? What is the expression for the rate of change of the y-coordinate with respect to theta? So we're looking for dy d theta. Okay, so first we need to find something, some expression for y. Let's sub in r, r of theta equals 7e to the theta, 7e to the negative theta. We multiply that by sine theta, and that equals our y-coordinate, okay? So, in order to get the dy d theta, we just differentiate this whole thing with respect to theta. So on the right side, if we differentiate the right side, we get dy d theta equals, differentiate the left side, that becomes uh, negative 7e to the negative theta times sine theta plus 7e to the negative theta times cosine theta. And we could factor out 7e to the negative theta. That's an 8, not a theta. And if we factor that out, we get sine theta, sorry, negative sine theta plus cosine theta. And that's dy d theta. Now, apart from that, we could go one step further. Instead of getting dy d theta, get dy dx. And for that, let's try another equation. Let's say r of theta equals 2 tan theta. And then we've got to put this in terms of x and y. Our y coordinate is uh, r times sine theta equals... Well, tan is sine over cosine, which means this would become 2 sine squared theta over cosine theta. Yeah, and then our x-coordinate, uh, since we're multiplying by cosine, tan is sine over cosine, we would just get 2 sine theta. Okay. Now we differentiate both of these with respect to theta. I hope you're uh, ringing bells and setting off alarms back from when we covered the parametric uh, half an hour ago. If we have a dy d theta and we have a dx d theta, we can have a dy dx by dividing dy d theta by dx d theta. dy d theta divided by dx d theta. The d thetas cancel out and you get a dy dx which is just the two things uh, set over one another. Tan squared theta plus two sine theta over cosine theta. So that's dy dx, and that's useful for when problems like the one I'm looking at right now ask you for the slope of a tangent line. In order to find the slope of a tangent line, you need to find the dy dx. It's asking for which value of theta does the graph have a vertical tangent line. Vertical tangent lines occur when the denominator of your dy dx is zero. So when we set our denominator equal to zero, we get two possible solutions, pi over two or three pi over two or and three pi over two. But we need to go back to our original function, two tan theta, and we need to make sure whether these solutions are extraneous or not. Okay, if we go to tan theta, and remember tan is the same as sine over cosine. And since we identified the locations at which cosine is zero, we identified the locations at which this denominator is also undefined. Therefore, this function is not defined at either of these two points. Therefore, it has no vertical tangents. So that's just a reminder that you always need to check the domain of your function when you're hit with a problem like this. When do you have vertical tangents? When do you have horizontal tangents? When you find where you could possibly have vertical or horizontal tangents, you always need to go back and check whether those uh, coordinates or points fit your domain. 
this this next thing I'm about to say might uh, awaken some PTSD in some of you. Area bounded by polar curves. Almost like area bounded between integrals. Uh, okay, alright, anyway. So let's say I give you a coordinate plane here and I give you a function looks a little bit like that. Okay. So we need to find the area bounded by this polar curve. And when we talk about that, we always mean area bounded between the curve and the origin, not between the curve and the x-axis. Okay? So, how are we going to go about that? Well, we can take a bunch of tiny cross-sections of the area, like triangles, and each of those, summed up, could give us an approximation of the area, but, you know, you guys already covered Riemann sums, you know where I'm headed with this. Where this is converging to is, ultimately, we are going to be able to take infinitely small cross-sections and uh, uh, use those to apply the formula for area of a circle. Now, I'm sure you all know the formula for area of a circle, pi r squared, but this isn't a full circle. Okay, it's part of a circle. We need to set up a ratio. Uh, how much of the circle do we want? So the full area of the circle is 2 pi radians, and we have our bounds as some radian measure, okay? So the fraction of the circle that we want is our total range of radians out of the 2 pi total radians, okay? You can see here that our pi terms cancel out, and we're left with r squared over 2 multiplied by our radi or the portion, the amount of radians that we're bounded between. So that's the formula for a standard circle. However, we're not dealing with a standard circle right here. We're taking infinitely small cross-sections which resemble a circle. So, instead of theta, we're going to be dealing with infinitely small theta. Okay? That looks like something we can integrate. So, with an integral between our bounds of integration, a equals some theta, b equals some other theta, we're going to integrate our r of theta squared with respect to theta. And that is the formula for area bounded within a polar curve with respect to theta. I'm bounded between, well in this case, a would be 0 and b would be pi over 2 but you could replace your bounds of integration with whatever you are dealing with with respect to your problem. Area between polar curves. So the same principles that applied in integrals also apply here. If you're given a coordinate system that's got, you know, how to put this, say, polar function like that and a polar function like that. They're two concentric circles, and you're looking for this area bounded between them from theta equals zero to theta equals pi over two, okay? So you would take your integral, of course the one-half remains constant, from a equals zero to b equals uh, pi over two, and you would take Let's call this uh, r sub 1 and the outer circle r sub 2, r of theta sub uh, 2 squared minus r of theta sub 1 squared d theta. Because if you break this up into two individual integrals, you get the area bounded by the outer 
circle, circle 2, minus the area bounded by the inner circle, circle 1. And that comes out exactly to your area bounded in this uh, between region. Now you can see another type of problem where it's a problem such as this, where you have one circle like that and one circle like that, and you're asked to find this area. This is different because in here you had one function that was clearly further from the origin than the other. Here, they're both the same distance from the origin. So the way you solve this is you split this uh, region down the middle because that's the region where the two uh, graphs intersect one another. And what you do here is you calculate, uh, this looks like um, 0, and this looks like pi over 2, but they intersect somewhere between that. They, let's call the intersection point pi over 4. Okay, this function here on the right side of the graph is r of theta equals 3 cosine theta, and this function on the top side of the graph is r of theta equals 3 sine theta. Okay, so 3 cosine theta and 3 sine theta intersect at pi over 4. So for this half, the, let's, let's call this uh, the right side, the right half of the area we're concerned with. And that would just simply be uh, the integral from theta equals 0 to theta equals pi over 4 of 3 cosine theta, area between origin and the polar function for cosine theta just this area right here, d theta, and then we would add that to the area between the origin, pi over 4, to pi over 2, the area between the origin and sine theta, 3 sine theta, d theta. Okay, so this integral on the left represents uh, the right half of the uh, area between these two curves, and this integral on the right represents this upper or left half of the area between the two curves. I hope you can see why that makes sense. If you don't get any of this right now, you know, Discord server is linked down below. Come chat with me. I'll be happy to help you out. Otherwise, um, enjoy life.